because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Talking with, <laughs> I'm talking with Kate uh, today, Selkirk Kate. Love it. Look at that. I mean, we're just making moves, Adam. You're, 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 you're moving, you're shaking, you're having conversations. As a high-end content creator, pickle influencer, and internet personality slash guru slash Adam Stone. Ladies Correct. and Correct. And I had, I had a beer with this lady in Mark Renison five, five or six years ago in Kelowna, uh, Kelowna, Canada. So it all, it's all coming full circle here. Uh, looky there. Looky hold, there. Hold, on, hold on. Hold on. Tell me, tell me more about Kelowna. I've only heard amazing things about that place. I've oh God, it's beautiful. It's unreal. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, British, so, British Columbia, right? That's, uh, that's yes. the, is that what profits? Uh, yeah. Canada's Kelowna, there, Kelowna it's, it's, BC. It's confusing. Yeah. yeah so BC. basically I've spent more time with basically anyone in the pickleball world with Tyler Loom. So I went up there because Chris Miller got hurt. So I stayed in a hotel room at Tyler Loom for like three days. The fan atmosphere was incredible. Like they yeah. love their pickleball up there. I mean, there was like three or 400 people crowded around the court watching us like ooing and aahing, uh, talking to us afterwards. So uh, not only were the people great, but the, the views and the, uh, and just the all the stuff, the mountains, the trees, the views, the lakes, all that crap was amazing. So pretty, pretty low key is it, too. Is, not, it, is it altitude? Like, is it in the mountains? Balance? A little bit, a little bit, but not yeah. bad. I think that's correct. Um, yeah. But I mean, beautiful, beautiful place, and I would definitely go back. I would recommend it to anyone. And it wasn't like overrun. It was kind of a lower key type city, town, whatever you want to call it, and. Uh, just a lot to like up there. I had a great time those few days. Love it. So Kate, Kate's, you know, Kate's conversation, that's going to be around potentially maybe who knows having a relationship with, um, with Selkirk. And yeah, I think, yeah. I think that would make a lot of sense, Adam, considering, you know, Selkirk's our sponsor for this pod. They are what allows this pod to happen. So if we were both, if we were both on that train, it would make a lot of sense. And you know what else we could do, Adam? We could just, we could go around the country, creating even more nonsense content in person yes. together, which would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, you gave me that incredible uh, introduction earlier, Rob, with about the eleven bullet points of what I am at this point in my career. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And hey, I'll tell you what, I will never say a bad word about Paddle Tech. Uh, good company, been with them my whole career, but definitely where I'm kind of aligning myself going forward in terms of off court stuff seems like it really lines up with Selkirk in a lot of ways. So no idea if we'll be able to get a deal done, but I, I think it is definitely a possibility with them uh, cornering the high end content creator market. And uh, you know, I just, I slot right into that uh, description. So of course uh, it makes a lot of sense to chat with Selkirk. You don't, you don't, you don't slot into that position. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm also very tech savvy. Let's put that on the list of, uh, what 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 was it? what was that? Do you know? Thing. So all, all I did was click it off the main mic and then put it back on. So that that's the extent okay. of my tech. Okay. Hey. The old unplug, plug it back in. I mean that shit works. It's real. Blow the cartridge. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, the old school. Uh, oh yeah. Do that for Nintendo Sega, and, Sega and Nintendo. That's right. When they used to have the cartridges back in the day. Um, oh, man. I don't know why that I don't know why that worked, but that, that it was like a hundred percent success rate. I mean, the key was just to make sure you didn't spit too much yeah. when you were blowing into the cartridge. Yeah. If you yep. got it wet, that's no good. But uh, yeah, that's that's. I mean, I think are all people. I feel like ninety nine percent of people age thirty five to fifty know what, exactly what we're talking about. So that's that's good. Hundred percent. And I think you, it's, you know, Nintendo's, it's made a comeback to where, you know, even, even the young folks are uh, playing some Nintendo just because it's I have a legit. switch. It's, it's, I have a switch. Yeah. And I, I know oh. it's Nintendo switch, but I don't know anything of like, I'm so out of the loop on video games now. What is, what is a switch? So the switch, it's just a new like console and you can like take it with you. So it's like basically a game boy and Nintendo in one and Corinne during the pandemic decided that she wanted just something for us to do together, uh, just to add it to the list of things that we could do together. So we got a Nintendo Switch, and then I just bought a, a, bunch, a bunch of one-player games and just froze her out. 
<laughs> so so we were supposed to like play two player games together and I just ordered a bunch of one player games and now she goes in the room and I play I play Switch by myself. So it's perfect. I love it. The last time I played video <laughs> games was um actually was actually peak pandemic time. I think it was March or April 2020. And um I've got a I've got a good friend named Philip McKernan who lives in Ireland uh with his wife and two kids, Maggie and Charlie. And I'm talking just like the best people, fantastic family. It's so funny. Like Maggie's like a 10 year old girl and she'll like come up, tap me on the shoulder from behind and like whisper in my ear thinking it's going to be like, you know, something sweet. And it's just like, F- you Rob. Oh, and I'm like, the 10 year old says that. Excuse me? And then like, she'll go, she'll leave it. <laughs> she'll leave and I'll go like, look back and she'll just be in the corner. Just like, well, give me mean eyes and just go. Wow. And I'm just like aggressive. I respect it. Nice, Maggie. Yeah. M- McKernan, uh, but anyways, Charles um, McKernan. Of course they live Irish, in Ireland Irish. with McKernan. Ooh, that's a nice one. Yeah. But uh, so Charlie, the boy, he was just like also like, I mean, he, they get this from their father. Just incredible <laughs> shit talker. Incredible shit talker as a kid. And uh, he was like, Rob, I want to beat you at FIFA. I'm like, I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have FIFA. I don't even know like what console I would need to get. So anyways, he, he tells me what to get. It's peak COVID. So I'm like, you know, I order pickup at Best Buy for a PlayStation. Go get the PlayStation, play FIFA with him. And I am just getting absolutely lit up by this 10-year-old. We both have headsets on. He's just talking shit the whole time. And I'm just like, this this is kind of fun. But I, I like, I'm pretty competitive in anything I do. And I did not like losing to a 12-year-old. So, but that's... I played and FIFA is kind of the go-to. Like I'm not even a big soccer guy, but like even in college, I played FIFA 96 on, on uh, what was it? It was, uh, what's the console? Uh, N64. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, that's my video game life. Yeah. Well, I mean, you were, uh, you started that story with the nice, sweet Irish family, best people. And it kind of took a turn for the worse it, talking about their relatively small children talking shit to you. So that, that was interesting. Uh <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, FIFA, FIFA was the jam when I was in college as well. So I mm-hmm. actually hung out with a yeah. lot of soccer guys. So I played, I played some FIFA and some Tiger Woods golf. Those were, those were the, those were my favorite too. So Classics. especially Main Tiger Woods golf. It's, it's really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah. So what do we got? We uh, got the, we got the PPA Desert Ridge just happened. Do we talk for a second about that? Briefly. We're, we're going to talk a second did, did about you, that. Did you match. watch, did you watch much of it? I watched a decent amount. I was in and out, you know, living my domesticated life. I'm uh, uh, currently, Robert, I am uh, clearing some brush in the backyard uh, and uh, blowing some leaves, of course, and then clearing some brush. And uh, I kind of had this little task. I'm taking care of it. And I get a text from my neighbor yesterday saying, uh, we have a slight snake problem in the neighborhood. Watch out for copperheads. So need, needless to say, I haven't been out in the backyard uh, uh, too much this last, whatever, 24 or 36 hours. I, I, I don't like snakes. I actually dreamed about them last night, and it's pretty terrible, <laughs> to be honest. And I know you – I don't know exactly what a varmint is, but I, I've heard you say plenty of times you do not like them. So oh, I, no don't, I don't blame you. Yeah, so getting in the leaves and blowing and all that stuff that happens out in the yard doing house husband type activities, yes, I can imagine yes. you're – pretty you're pretty the whole time yes and i think most people consider a varmint a mammal you know like a raccoon or a possum or something like that i just i pretty much label all of it they're, they're all varmints to me snakes bugs <laughs> mammals it, it doesn't matter they're all varmints and i i'm just not a big fan of any of them so uh there it is no varmints yeah. so okay. okay so ppa briefly um, briefly we'll yeah. talk about it briefly Sure. Yes, and we'll just talk, and then we'll just you know kind of talk some crap about all kinds of random stuff uh, uh, after that, and we'll just see where it takes us, Robert. See see what feels right. Can I, I, I watched a fair amount on Championship Sunday, so I'll go. Can I go into kind of some of the final ish results, and then you can Absolutely. talk about the earlier rounds because I don't know all the earlier round stuff. So let me do watching. that. So I I will go through the yeah. draw very briefly, and then you talk about that. So men's doubles, uh, we'll start off there. Very 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 chalky. Uh, very Job. standards. Yeah. Very standard stuff. Maybe a very slight upset or two, but nothing too major. Um, and then we had the classic 
uh, Matt and Riley uh, battling it out with uh, Colin and his brother. And I don't think really either one had too much issue getting to that championship Sunday. Uh, not even there, there might've been a, there might've been a, a three gamer mixed in, but nothing, nothing too surprising at all. And uh, a pretty, you know, uh, closely uh, close games in the final, but I believe it was three games. Was it not in the final or was it four? Yeah, it was three games. And okay, uh, go ahead. No, I just feel like, like we talk about this a lot when it comes to conditions, like conditions, slower conditions, heavily favors uh, Colin and his brother and faster conditions definitely favors uh, Matt and Riley. So conditions were a little slower. It was, uh, I, I believe it was a w- little bit of a, a warmer day the ball softened up a mm-hmm. lot um and yeah that that definitely gets that definitely gets uh them into their patterns the longer patterns that they're looking to looking to do you know the longer dink rallies i think matt matt made quite a few dink errors a little bit uncharacteristic you know from him he usually is pretty solid um speed ups weren't quite as effective as typical um i i, I can't under um under explain i don't know what the word is but the, even the ball soft understate even the ball even the ball softening just a bit changes the game significantly um so i don't know if everybody at home knows that but uh, the conditions of the, the conditions outside and the softness or hardness of the ball very 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 much changes how you play this game so yes. um yeah and conditions just were great for the for the johns brothers so you know, not a huge surprise in that, you know, I could have seen that going to maybe four or five, but, right. um, straight, straight games, this go around and, um, you know, getting into the warmer weather in the summer months, you know, we'll see what happens, but, um, yeah, not, not a whole lot of, not a whole lot of teams challenging very much at this point. Right. Yeah. And I think you're right, Rob. Uh, I, I heard Colin's brother mention an interview in one of the early round matches that even though, this is the same place as Mesa in the MLT. The ball was significantly different and, and much warmer and playing much softer than it was just a week ago at MLP Mesa. And I think this and even, is. And I was going to say, even still, and in, in, in Mesa with that quarter, with the quarter weather, we were playing with the Franklin X40 ball, um, right, which, right. which, which played much faster and harder. It sounds like than a Dura did this weekend in that weather. Right. Right. And and, uh, yeah, so JW Marriott, I mean, whatever, 30 or 40 minutes north, I believe, but obviously the same place. So uh, the same same type of weather, maybe possibly the overhang could have had something to do with it as well. You know, on that championship court at Bell uh, Bell Bank Park, there's no sun on the ball. So it's it's always shady. Uh, I think just being out in the open and the sun really affects the, the ball as well. So uh, uh, definitely big factors. And one thing that I would, one more thing that I would say about men's doubles is we have some real solid teams and Tyler Lung and Callan Dawson, Julian Arnold, Thomas Wilson, uh, you know, kind of those upper middle class teams. Uh, I'm excited to see AJ and Deckel start playing together in some of these PPAs. Uh, I think that their floor is fairly low, but they also have a very high ceiling, Rob. So I think that uh, you you would put that them as the fourth in the mix of those top four teams. You have Matt and Riley, you have Colin and his brother, you have JW and Dylan, and then you have AJ and Declan. I think they belong in that tier so they can really challenge to possibly win a tournament. And then you have those other teams that are very good. Uh, as I mentioned, Julian Thomas, uh, Callan and Tyler, pretty consistent results. But I, I want to see AJ and Deckel in the mix because I think that they are really a team that could beat those top two teams. And I think, you know, Loong and Callan and obviously Julian Thomas, you know, those guys, it's tough for them to beat those top two teams because they're so good. Yeah, no, absolutely agree. Did, did Deckel play this past weekend? He didn't. He didn't. I so I talked to him. He, he, he was in a pickleball getaway in Mexico. So I think he's pretty much planning on playing everything or close to it moving forward, even though he hasn't played these first two uh, uh, for 2023. So uh, uh, moving and on to mix. Kohler played with Eric. I was Eric just going to say played with That's Eric right. Lang this past weekend. Right. And, and right. I think they had. Um, so we can, we should also talk about the, the way the draws are structured now, because right. they have, if you get to the semis, you're basically guaranteed third or fourth. Whereas in before to get third, you'd have to fight all the way through the back draw. So they've changed it to where 
it's much more advantageous to not lose in the main draw and get yes. to at least the semis to where you're guaranteed a top four finish. Because if you lose in the quarters or before, the best you can finish in that tournament is fifth place. And that's basically yes. winning the backdrop. I mean, I literally think this is the first tournament that they did that. So that's a very good point. I didn't have that down in my notes, but that's a huge deal to only be able to get fifth, sixth, base fifth, fifth spot because you'll play out the match. Um, and then you can yep. get third uh, bronze or fourth if you make it to the semis. I mean, personally, quite a few times in my career, I have made it to the semis and then got fifth, sixth. So basically you make it to the semis and lose, lose. I think it's a pretty common, actually a pretty common pattern. So this, this change in structure definitely affects what's going on uh, in these tournaments in terms of bronze medal through the, the fifth, sixth spot. So a uh, very good point. And um, do you like it, Adam? I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I think I, I think I prefer it the other way. I think that they they made the change to penalize that main draw loss, whatever it was, a year, year and a half ago, and I think that that's great. But I I kind of like the comeback through in some regard, and I thought it was maybe a little bit more balanced before this rule that has changed it to losing in the semis, going to the third fourth match. Uh, I I don't I wouldn't say I think, my my view is super strong, but I I, I kind of liked it how it was before. Yeah, there's a couple interesting points I find in in this format, and one being that there's already been a lot of like pushback and people like thinking that the seating is rigged in PPA players' favor, that kind of thing. It makes seating a much bigger deal, um, and yeah, so so seating is a huge deal, like not losing in the main. But you could have you know you could have a lower seed than what you think you what you should actually be and um and pull an upset and or, or or run into a one or two seed when you shouldn't be playing them until further yep. along and it just kicks you into the back draw right away which really really penal penalizes you in this format so yeah. i see that being really tough the other the other point that i think about in this is that you're gonna have you're gonna have a fifth place team that's only lost one match in this tournament and you're gonna have a and you're gonna have a a fourth place team that's lost two matches, which seems right. strange, right? To, you know, to it have does. a better record as the fifth place team versus the fourth place team. So uh, just a couple points that I, that I thought about when, when seeing that, um, I don't have a huge take on it or, you know, preference either way. I just think seating's real. It, it makes seating much more important. It's huge. It's huge. I know it's going by PPA points and you see it right now where you have, Callan and Tyler Loom as the three seed. And I yeah. believe that it should be JW Johnson and Dylan. So, yeah. uh, so you have basically right now without AJ and Deckel in the mix, I would like to see their PPA points and where they stack up in those top six seeds or whatever, but you have uh, Riley and Matt as the clear cut two. Then you have uh, Tyler Loom and Callan as the three, which I think they should they should be the four. And then you have JW and Dylan playing the number one seed, uh, Colin and his brother. So yeah, the, the more penalties that you have from coming back through is definitely makes the seating even more important. And I know it'll get settled, but uh, yeah, when you have a one, four matchup and a two, three matchup, if number three and the number four seeds are flip flop, that's a huge deal, especially given the changes in format. So uh, good observations yep. by you. Uh, let's move on to mixed here. Uh, we had a new partnership with Anna Riley, Anna, Anna Riley, Anna Bright and Riley Newman. Uh, I believe they lost 11-9 in the third to Matt and Lucy in the semis. So a battle there. Uh, Matt and Lucy, anytime, anytime you're like, oh, hey, you know, they, they've dipped a little bit. Maybe the game's passing them by. Man, they just they just have a good result and, and get back in the mix. So nice job by them. A uh, couple, a solid run in the back draw from uh, James Ignatowicz and Lindsey Newman. They beat two or three very good teams. I don't think they finished higher than fifth, sixth, but a, a couple of nice wins from them in the back draw that they were not favored for. And I also noticed that Hayden Patrick when pulled out of both events, uh, the men's and the mixed. He was matched up with Maggie Brasha, who had to pull out of MLP last weekend. So I, I don't know if that was related to her or him, but I did notice that he was in the draw in both events and then ended up not in the draw. Not exactly sure what's going on there. I hope everything is okay. Um, did you see this uh, championship Sunday match? What'd you think about it, Rob? I, that's, I think it was the first match of the day and it's the one I didn't see, but 
but and I probably didn't see it because I think it was pretty quick. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure yeah. the final score, but I, th- I think it was three games and relatively straightforward. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, not really surprising with a, I definitely on paper would favor, uh, Anna Bright and Riley Newman first time partnership. Not surprised that they lost a close one to Matt and Lucy, not surprised either that in the championship Sunday match, they, uh, it was relatively routine as, uh, you know, Colin's yeah. brother and, and Anna Lee are, are pretty next level right now. So, um, and I think every, everybody wanted to see the, the Anna Bright, Riley Newman matchup. Uh, sure. so right. Bum, bummer. We didn't get to see it. Um, yeah. you know, new partnership for, for Anna and Riley. I think, I think, you know, Anna's, Anna's outwardly said that mix is her toughest event in terms mm-hmm. of getting comfortable, kind of playing a different role. Um, whereas in women's, she can, she can be a bit more aggressive and, and right. mixed. It's, it's just a completely different game for women. And I think that's a yeah. general consensus that we've heard is that mixed, mixed, generally speaking for women is their least favorite event. And I think, you know, probably for most men, it's their least favorite event too. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. so mix, mix is what it is. It's a little bit a diff, of a different learn, learning curve, especially playing with somebody like Riley, who's so dominant and can take up so much court and so long and can create from wherever and, yeah, you know, just, right. just on that note, like we talk about how versatile Dylan is all the time. Um, you know, one thing I did notice on championship Sunday throughout a few matches was um, like, so Anna Lee and Catherine played together and they, they switched it up. Like I, I'm just very, very impressed how well Riley can play both sides, how well Anna Lee can play both sides. Um, it's very, very difficult to do. And it just shows how good of players they are and how well-rounded they are. It's really impressive. And I, that's just something that stood out to me watching that day. Yeah, definitely. We, we talk about the people knowing their role. So, and that's, I still think that's going to continue to happen more and more frequently specialists. So when you have those sprinkled in players that really are that versatile and barely any different on both sides, I think it, it as you, as you said, it, it kind of screams to, to their talent level when they're, when they're able to do that. So uh, yeah, no, absolutely true. And, and I, I don't think anything of the, the Riley and Anna not making it the championship Sunday new partnership. Yeah. Now, if they would have lost five and three to Matt and Lucy, sure. Maybe that's a little more shocking or stunning, uh, but first time partnership in a battle in the semis to make championship Sunday. I don't think much of it. Uh, they're they're going to have to, maybe underperformed three or four times before I really think too much about it. Uh, small sample size, of course. So, uh, oh, and we had uh, fairly chalky in, in mixed doubles as well, but in women's doubles, not so much, Rob. We had the yep. uh, old school uh, Sarah Ansbury partnering up with Bobby Oshira, the number 17 seed, to not only have one big upset, but two very big upsets on their way to making the semifinals. They defeated Lucy and Callie, the number one seed, and they also defeated uh, Coop and Georgia Johnson, who I thought was a, one of those teams that really could make a run in this tournament. Congratulations to them. Phenomenal run. I'm not exactly sure what happened in these matches, but either way, uh, two big wins for Oshiro and, and Ansbury. Yeah, I saw I saw Ansbury Oshiro play a little bit, and most impressive to me was you know there's a couple of things that I've thought have limited Sarah in the past, and um, I think it's been some it's been some injury related stuff with her movement, but she seemed to be moving really really well, getting to the kitchen line on time, uh, which you know turns out matters a lot in pickleball, and then <laughs> also also developing some some new attacks. She was a bit more aggressive. And I think Sarah's kind of known for just being that steady, fundamental, um, solid player that doesn't give you much, but also doesn't hurt you very much. But what we saw in this tournament was, you know, she plays really well on the left and she plays well in kind of the alpha role where she can create and move things around and, and actually look to attack. She's, she's actually, in my opinion, pretty underrated in that respect. So, you know, we saw her f- like flicking some backhand rolls at people, um, you know, maybe the frequency is a little bit more than, than sh- it should have been, but like, you know, that takes some time to figure out, but I was impressed with how, um, with how aggressive she played and how effective it actually was. And Bobby's super solid. She's not going to make a lot of errors, good hands. And yeah, I mean, what a, what a result for them. I think they were the 17 or 18 seed and, you know, took down the one seed and had, had, you know, took down Andrea and Georgia, which was a huge win. 
I thought that win was probably more impressive than, than taking down Lucy and Cali, to be honest. Um, so yeah, yeah. Epic, epic, epic weekend for, the, for, for those ladies, big props. Yeah, definitely true. And I think you're right. Uh, Ansberry, uh, I, I don't think anyone would label her as an explosive mover, but I do yeah. think that's that she did have some knee issues, not saying that those are totally gone. So to, to play a little more left side alpha role without taking a huge amount of court i think it speaks to some of the quality of her speed ups and some of the her ability to mix in some more offense as opposed to just being the dinker and the blocker on the team so uh you're right uh, good job by her we had leia and elise uh sneaking in after losing a first game uh to uh ansbury and oshiro a pretty comfortable uh, second and third game from them to move on to a championship sunday and uh, you know, some people might say there was a break in the draw or, you know, they had a pretty easy ride to Championship Sunday. But the Championship Sunday match was not terribly lopsided, pretty close four games and some pretty closely uh, competitive games of those four games. What do you think about that final? Well, before we get into the final, Adam, uh, let's talk about that semi between I think it was Anna Bright and Vivian David with uh, versus a- A.L. and Catherine. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yeah, thought that was going to. I thought I thought that was going to be like a highly contested match, and I don't think I've ever seen Catherine play better in that match than I've I, than I've ever seen her play. Like that was an absolute drumming, and it and it took me by surprise. Al right. and Catherine, I mean, I've never that might be the that might be the best I've seen a women's doubles team play that match. Like it was that impressive to me. They just absolutely steamrolled Viv and Anna, and there's nothing they could have done. Uh, Catherine was like. Her hands were ridiculously fast. She was digging out everything. Um, they were, bless you. They were, they were moving well. I mean, it was just like, it was so dominant that it took me, it, it like took me by surprise. So I was like, okay, they're good together, Catherine yeah. and Annalia. Nobody that, you know, that's not surprising to anybody, but I was surprised at that result of how lopsided it was. So going into the championship Sunday against Elise and Leia, I'm like, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be an absolute drumming again. And um, Leia impressed the hell out of me. Like she, she played really, really well on the left side. Um, you know, Elise, I felt like Elise, it felt like kind of maybe the first kind of big stage that she's been on. And I think it showed a little bit in terms of decision-making. She sped up some balls. She typically wouldn't. It felt like from the court, you know, she's usually just a rock and doesn't miss. And she, she played great. Right. But, you know, it's different playing in these championship Sunday matches with, uh, you know, especially when you're playing AL and Catherine. So, uh, but Leia, but Leia was, you know, I thought Leia was really impressive. I hadn't seen her really play in a while. And I think having a partner where she feels supported and positive with, um, like Elise, Elise, I, you know, fantastic partner, very supportive. And I think that's exactly what Leia needs. And I, I love their chemistry. I love their vibe on court. I think they're going to continue to develop and get better and better. And I think they're going to be a team to be reckoned with. I think they're going to be a kind of a top three seed team moving forward this year. And I, I love the balance of having, you know, the state, the steadiness of Elise and the, and the firepower of Leia. So that's a team to watch for sure. Um, and yeah, they, they played them, they played them close. They played them. I think they, they took a game. It went to, did it go to four? Was that right? Yeah, it was four, but close games, the ones they lost also. I think a lot of sevens, eights, and nines in those three games they lost, right? Yeah, so in my in my eyes, that's it's, it's an impressive performance, especially considering how well Catherine and Anna Lee were playing. And um, yeah, I look forward to more of that. I look forward to more of those matchups. And I love the yeah. fact that w- women's, you know, it's, 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 um, it's getting tighter at the top. Like there's more teams that could win now, which I love to see. And I think most fans watching love to see too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I'll touch on some of those things. Uh, always been a good mover, Catherine Parento, but I think she's taken it to another level. I know uh, she has a personal trainer. A lot of players are starting to get that. And I also think that possibly not, not for sure, but possibly the paddle switch has given her a little bit more power on her hands. So uh, I think that that was probably, that was probably the one thing uh, that could be questioned about her game. Phenomenal all around game, but maybe a lack of power, put away power and power in exchanges. And I think that that's gotten a little bit better for her uh, with the paddle switch. And then of course she's always had the incredible variety. So uh, yeah. And I think that, 
you know, there's let, let, let's not understate some of the things going on outside the lines in some of these matches. I know Leia has had a little beef with Catherine. We had the Catherine and Elise thing. So I, I've actually spoken with Leia, and I think that while some players maybe play a little bit worse if they're upset or there's outside things going on in the court, uh, my wife being one of them, I think some players get locked in and play better as well. So I think that Leia has mentioned something about there's been a little bit of beef between a few players, and I think that she has said uh, that it locks her in and makes her extra focused and, and, and extra uh, wanting to win and as opposed to having her mind go in a bunch of different directions and make her play worse, it makes her narrow her focus and play better. Just something to think about in some of these matchups uh, as we're seeing at the top. Yeah. I don't think there's too many players like that, but I think she's definitely one of them that. Yeah, that right. Really yeah, hard. right. Right. And I, I know I, I can think of multiple players, you know, five or so that don't respond well to it when they're angry or upset and five that, that do. So it's, it's different for everyone. And uh, I just, I just wanted to mention that as, as a lot of these ups and downs between partner switches and uh, whatever uh, can, can affect that what's going on in the match. Uh, not, not don't want to understate that. Yep. And we'll just go real quick with, with singles here, Rob, pretty chalky men's and women's. Similar finals, uh, nothing too crazy in terms of upsets. Uh, that's the singles breakdown uh, on It Feels Right. I love podcast. it. <laughs> Boom. 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 Okay, perfect. So, Rob, let's get into some more kind of general questions. Uh, nothing too structured here. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the questions if we get a, a break in time. And, and we're just going to chat and have some open-ended stuff here. So, first off, uh, Robert – Tell me, tell me about the early stages of this 2023 nomadic lifestyle and some of the advantages, pitfalls, and some of the things you've been enjoying about it so far this, this first month of 2023. Yeah, Adam. Uh, I, so you can see kind of backdrop here. I'm at an Airbnb in Jacksonville Beach right now, um, just kind of bouncing around. This has kind of been the longest break I've had between events which was, you know, still not very long, probably 10 days in between <laughs> M MLP and, you know, I'm going down to Daytona for the APP tomorrow. So, you know, people keep asking like, so, so, you know, where do you live? I'm like, nowhere and everywhere. I, I, I don't know. I don't have a home, nor do I really feel like I need a home at this point. It's, it's with 10 days in between, it's like, you know, I've got like, I was able to see my mom. I was able to go to Savannah, visit some friends, be here in Jack's Beach, also close to my mom, but also has some good practice here. Um, so it, like to go like my, I've got four bags to my name, Adam. I've got two Selkirk bags with me that are my pickleball bags. I've got two rollaway suitcases at my buddy Shane's house in Utah. So my stuff's kind of, I guess if we talk about like, <laughs> where's my stuff, my, my stuff's at a house in a basement in Utah. But I don't really need anything in there other than my Do I know, podcast. I know movie. Shane, don't I? I know Shane, don't I? You met Shane in Florida. You do. Yeah, be you before we yeah. went to yes. Costa Rica. Yes. So it's possible that he gave yeah. us COVID. It's possible. It's. It, it, I think it was Lucho, but yes, it's possible. <laughs> Lucho. I still remember him. Exactly. Please tell the Lucho story. Please tell oh, the Lucho God, Lucho. Stories. So we go down to Costa Rica. So we were in, yeah. It's kind of mid, I mean, this is kind of the big, it's right in the middle of the pandemic. So it's kind of that point where everyone's kind of wanting to get social again, but at the same time, it's still a little dicey. And I'll tell you what, we walk into this house party in Costa Rica. I'm kind of, a little, you know, thinking about COVID a little bit. And sure enough, I walk right in. This guy, Lucho, just gives me a big hug and basically spits in my mouth. Like I, I literally. Well, so. so Context about who this guy is and why he spit in your mouth. And then also we did, we shared something which also probably led to COVID. Yes. No, no, for sure. For sure. So Lucho is just a friend of a friend. He's from Argentina. I believe he got stabbed in his uh, early life and almost died. And now he's Horse just living bird. life to his fullest. Yes. It's just living life to his fullest. And he was very into social interaction. He was trying to kiss the girls and he was close talking aggressively 
in our faces and I could literally see bits of spit flying out, but we're in a different country. I don't want to be rude. So what, what am I, do, what am I going to yeah. do? I just kind of, just kind of stood there and took it. So I think that <laughs> might've, might've had something to do with our COVID. And then also in Costa Rica, we had a lovely dinner. We had a, uh, adult beverage in between us. And I looked over to you, Robert, and I said, Rob, is that your beer or my beer? You stare deep into my eyes for about 10 seconds and you go, it's our beer. And sure enough, two days later, we both had COVID. <laughs> so just what good times the, in Costa Rica. Uh, what was that drink that that's like native to our, maybe not native to our, but they, uh, it's like the hot tea or hot coffee that we share with the leaves in it. You know what I mean? Like, what, Oh, Yerba Mate? Remember that? Is it Yerba Mate? It was, no? No, I feel, I feel like that's just like a, like a canned tea we have here, but maybe, maybe it's, it was, it was one of those drinks, but like, he's like, this is what we do in Argentina. We drink and right. we pass it around and we share yes. the drink. And it's yes. like, but like, but very, very, very caffeinated, whatever it yes. was. I think it's and I remember just like, maybe so. But I just remember passing it around this hot drink with leaves in it. And I'm just like, we're all just slobbering on this thing together. Of course. And like, the fact that we came back from Costa Rica with COVID, I don't know why I was surprised, but I was. But mm-hmm. looking back at that trip, it's like, of course we had COVID. Uh, yeah, of course, COVID of course we, we did. Went. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're yeah, in a different country. Yeah. You don't, you, you don't want to be disrespectful, Rob. You don't want to be disrespectful. No. You got to drink the no. drink, you know? <laughs> and our beer. Our beer. And also, let's not forget, Robert, that we were on a, a bit of a time squeeze to get our COVID tests so that we could oh, get back yeah. into the country. And they basically gave us false negatives. It's guaranteed. We all had COVID. Everyone on the trip had COVID. (laughs) We told the people, hey, we need these results because we're flying out very early in the morning. And they just gave us false negatives and signed our paperwork and let us go. We had no idea. We get back to the States. We realize we all have COVID. I think it's about a 99.9% chance we got false positive false negatives to get back in the country so wild trip robert we we were on a helicopter on that trip too helicopter we're in a helicopter that was fun yeah we were on a helicopter we got uh yeah i remember the day we got back like i went and i went to go play pickleball and you're gonna go play too and then like you you like changed your mind pretty rapidly play and then you were just out and then it took me, me till the next day and then i was just well, yeah. Gone. Yeah. I, t- I took like a six hour nap in the middle of the day. I, I, that's a little odd even <laughs> for me. So I, I, I realized that something, something wasn't quite right. Uh, of course, went and got tested, you know, just instant positive uh, along with everyone else. So, you know, whatever. Good, good times, I guess, Robert. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was Shane. We met Shane, we met Shane before, uh, or you met Shane before we went to Costa Rica. Uh, but he's my, he's my buddy in Salt Lake. My stuff's there. I probably won't be back there until after. So from he, from Daytona, I'm going to play the PPA. Yeah. PPA. I'm playing a PPA in Mesa going back. Mm. And, uh, then I'm going to go from the PPA in Mesa to play the PPA in Minnesota. Look at me. I'm just a PPA guy, bro. Just PPA guy. PPA. Here. You're, you're, you're play a, a PPA in, in Minnesota. And then I'm going to go to salt lake to see my buddy shane stay with him for a little bit practice like the, the nice part about having salt lake be a little bit of a home base is that the practice is great there's always people mm-hmm. to play with i mean you've got you've got spencer you've got cal you've got tyler loon who doesn't pull, practice very much but he'll, he'll play occasionally you got a, a new player that that played with uh spencer and tyler at byu named patrick uh kaka maybe like he's he's starting to show up in some pro draws and uh where, where he, he hits Pope? the hell out of the ball where's todd oh Pope yeah yep yeah. he's, he's kind of north salt lake city uh chuck taylor uh you yeah. got gr- the grid the griddler actually just moved to alabama so i think he's gone but you have the unicorn there um who else we got i mean the practice is great there's always guys to play with and always guys sure. to get good games with so yeah so it's and, a good, it's a good all... spot to be the, and those are all legit pros. And yeah. I think there's probably 10 to 12 legit five O's there as well. So it's a deep player pool. You know, often when we have four or five or six quality players in an area, 
it's hard to get all four on the same court. But when you have like 15 yeah. or 20 people to choose from, makes it much easier to get a game every day and extremely important in between tournaments. So that is a nice little oh, mini, mini home base. Yeah, and uh, and the difference between there and like when I've been down here in Florida, or like the Delray area, it's like I think I said like you're having to bounce from public park to find a court. The courts are always mm-hmm. busy. Um, and like in Utah, the picklers popping off, it's a bunch of indoor facilities. They're actually sponsoring me as a player, which is epic because they're helping out with some costs and stuff. Uh, but so being there, it's like, you know, you always have an indoor court. They have five or six locations. You can pop into any of them, basically get a court without stressing about it. So you always have a place to play, um, indoors too. I'm a big indoors guy. I think pickleball should be an indoor sport. I think I've gone on the record saying that no variables. You get clean stuff, clean pickleball. The wind can always be a disaster. We're playing with a wiffle ball. What are we doing? Okay. <laughs> that's my rant. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So nomad life's fun, man. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll run into a time where it's like, man, I just want my own bed. I want my own things. I want my own space, that kind of thing. But until then I'm having fun doing kind of the, just the roaming around. I don't feel, I don't feel unsettled at all. I feel like I've got everything I need. I'm, I like being in different locations. Uh, I don't feel tied down to anything or anybody. I feel good. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice. And that's, that's well said, Rob. And I remember my nomadic days at the beginning when I was, you know, spending a month or two per year, uh, with my roommates, uh, my roommates being Terry and Jeannie Stone, my parents, (laughs) uh, and I would, (laughs) and I would just travel around for 10 months and there's obviously good and bad things about it, but I like the freedom of it. And I think for me personally, I, I am cool with that lifestyle. I don't think that's everyone's uh, preferred uh, way, to, to way to live. So uh, now I'm a little more domesticated yeah. and that's okay as well. But uh, just for the record, Robert, real nomads say everywhere and nowhere, not nowhere and everywhere. So get that, get that everywhere situation. Everywhere and nowhere. Uh, you're, okay. you, you're everywhere and nowhere. So that's much better. Everywhere and nowhere. Um, yes. And I wanted to ask something. Uh, you you meant we talked about how there's so many uh, nice players to play with in Utah, and I've kind of found that throughout the course of practicing, especially when you're on the tournament grind, it's actually not only difficult to get four quality players on the court, but to have everyone focused as well. So I've I've found that my practices would go way up and down. Maybe the second minute of the practice, Colin gets hit in the head. The practice is over. The practice is over. You're done. Uh, you get three people locked in, excited to play high level pickleball. Someone had a bad day at work and, you know, they're not into it. So tell me a little bit about that and how important it is to stay focused in practice and how difficult that is when you're on the tournament grind. Yeah, I think it's it's probably one of the least talked about things in terms of uh, practice and playing rec and, and getting, you know, four good players on a court. And, and, and it's super rare. I used to like one guy that I always like, I respect highly. And I, I, I think he's always been like, there's just some players that dial in and wreck because they know it's kind of their job and that's what they do. Mm-hmm. And they're showing up, even if they don't want to be there, even if they're in a bad mood. And that's, that's, you know, Steve podium Deacon. He's always, he's in practice. He's always locked in. He's always going to give it best. You know, he, he might do some, different speed ups that he normally wouldn't do in a, in a match. And then he'll just like kind of look over at you go, Rob, that's R and D, you know, research and development, baby. <laughs> oh, so yeah. It's just, you oh, know, yeah. te- testing, testing a few different things that maybe you wouldn't do in actual matches. But other than that, he plays, he still plays really clean. And uh, that's what you, that's what you look for. You, you want, you want people to play the right way. Like you would actually play um, in tournaments. And that's one thing I noticed when being up in, in Coeur d'Alene with Tyson is he plays very, very different in practice than he does in tournaments. Like he's, he's moving all over the place. He's speeding up basically everything. Um, and I think you see that with Colin too, right? Colin and Rec, like, you, you know, his frequency in, in tournaments is like one out of 30, you know, dinking, like, you know, dink to speed up ratio. Um, mm-hmm. and, and in practice, it's one to two. Um, yeah, right. And right. yeah. So, so it's, it's hard to, it's, I, I think the way, like, you know, a surefire way to get good games and rec is actually put money on the line where people are actually, you know, it makes you focus and lock in. Whereas if you're just playing to play, 
it's hard to have four people in the same mindset of like, you know, let's, let's not take any points off. Let's play this. Like we're actually playing a match in a tournament. Um, but that's how, I mean, you want to, you want to, you want to practice like you play. You want to practice like it's a tournament. I'm sure you like, I think, I think Steve Deacon has the right mindset practice like you play, but also try some things, work on some things, um, test some things out that maybe you wouldn't test out in a tournament. But um, it is it is a challenge to to do it. But I think even if you have guys that are kind of taking practice off and not super focused, like you can always like for me, I can always get something out of it. I can always work on my own thing. Even if you're not getting good balls from your from your opponents, you can always you can always get something out of it. Like I even get stuff out of drilling with a four zero. Like you know, as long as they're hitting me a decent ball, like and I'm getting to feel the ball and work on stuff, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't need much more than that. Yeah, no, that's that's well put, and I think it is important. I think it's pretty standard too that you play a little more aggressive and practice to work. We're R and D, like like Steve Deacon said. But yeah. I know there's a handful of players that are very good players that I am not really looking to practice with before a tournament, and then some I really like to. And like uh, who? Uh, no, we won't. We won't talk about that. We won't talk about <laughs> that. Uh, we both have our list. Mort- there's, I mean, it's pretty. Judge- it's pretty well known. Jeff Warnick garbage to practice with. Uh, yeah. I don't really like, love the guy. I don't really like practicing with Wes Gabrielson too. He's lobbing and, and you know, you, you, it can be light and it can be not tournament serious, but I want to play like points that are tournament style. So there's definitely uh, some importance to that. And I, I'm in the boat of, I would much rather practice tournament style for 90 minutes than those guys that go out there for three or four hours and don't really practice anything, just hit the ball for four hours. Uh, I, I don't really yep. get that, especially someone who's, you know, aspire is a pro or aspiring to be a pro. So I uh, just wanted to bring that up. Uh, Rob, I got another question for you. Adam, I got, I got a couple yes. more points on this one, Adam. Just, oh, uh, please, please, just, please go ahead. Just, yeah, no, just a, just an early story from um, when I had just first started playing in Austin and we were down in San Marcos and I remember mm-hmm. you, it was the very, very first time we played at Texas State on those outdoor courts. You know, the ones that Walter would, Walter would tape them up, have the temp nets out there. And, you know, it's one of those days where I was just so stoked because you're going to be there. I was like, let's go. <laughs> bring, my, bring my A game today. And I think Thomas Wilson was also there at that time. Um, yeah, I don't know if a lot of people know our early crew. Like when I was first starting, I mean, Thomas had been playing for a while, but, you know, not taking it very seriously because uh, his mom played and, but always wildly talented, could hit the hell out of the ball. Um, but also in those early days, some of my first sessions were uh, with Brandon Insect Pong. He's played for quite mm-hmm. a long time, mm-hmm. and uh, he was kind of one of the regulars out there. But I remember it was it was me, Thomas. I think me and Thomas were on the same side. You and Brandon Insect Pong were playing together, and like you know, we actually had a point. At, like it was a long point, maybe you know, for Rec, it was you know maybe thirty shots and. And afterwards you were like, guys, that was, that was like a real point. I was like, <laughs> is that like a, like a dig, but like a compliment? Like what, like I didn't understand like, oh, that's how tournament points should be played. You know, yes, it was always right, kind of like right. drive, drive, crash, try to put the ball. Like, sure, like we didn't have sure. many extended, extended rallies and extended dink rally. So I was like, oh, there's something, oh, like, so that's, you know, that was this is before I had ever played a tournament, so I didn't understand tournament play versus rec play. I was just like, "This is pickleball." This is um, how you play. So that, right, that, right. that always that always just stood stood with me of like, "Oh, that was an actual point." Like, right, oh, so that's right. like the point for life, you know? Yeah, no, so, it's it's true. I mean, people speeding up off their shoe shoe tops and doing all kinds of crazy stuff in rec. So that that was a uh, yeah. I mean, to like I said, four quality players on the court there. And often, you know, sometimes that isn't isn't the best practice. So to you, you got to play somewhat realistic to the tournament. Have fun. Make a you make a, talk a little crap in between points. Keep it light, but keep it serious as well. And I think that that gets lost in translation sometimes. Uh, and it's it's very very important for like I said, aspiring pros and people that are already in the mix and, and want to reach that top ten level or whatever it may be. So uh, yeah, very important. And yeah, I remember those early days too. It was fun. Uh, getting you guys out there, getting Thomas. Thomas, he was only playing maybe once or twice a month at that point. So nice to see him step yeah. up. And Brandon Insect Pong was just a teeny bit after my time. There was a little overlap there that we were playing together. Um, but yeah, good times early on. And hey, practice with the purpose, guys. It's real stuff. It's gonna it's gonna take you to that next level. Let's go, Adam. 
on those early days yes. as well. I remember like, I remember I was like nervously asked you, I was like, Hey man, like, would you, uh, would you like want to, want to get a beer with me? I like, <laughs> wanted to talk to you. I like wanted to talk to you about trying to like, uh, on like pursuing pro pickleball is like, and right. I wanted to, I was so eager to get better and I wanted to figure out like what I needed to do and what I needed to improve on. And then I remember we, we like went to this little restaurant in San Marcos with the Dormans and Kevin Stark. Oh, and the Stark like, man. Oh yeah. And I think you went to the bathroom before me and I was like, I'm just going to follow him in the bathroom and ask him a question. I have a <laughs> so like, we're both like, we're both at like the urinal and I'm like, so Adam, like, what, like, what do you think I need to, what do you think I need to do better? Like, or like, like, what do I need? And you're like, and you, you're just like, Rob, to be relevant, you have to have the soft game. I was like, it's true. You mean I don't have the soft? You mean I don't I don't have the soft game? And at the time, I definitely did not have the soft game. I hit a couple <laughs> dinks, right? But like, I couldn't stay in a dink rally for an extended period of time. Extended period of time. But um, sure. yeah, just funny, just funny, really early stories about you know, pro pickleball and, and our relationship because that was like kind yeah. of the first time I met you, and I was like, yeah, you were you were real guy's quiet. Doing it. I want to get better. Oh, I right. Yeah. You were first. real quiet at first. I remember you messaged me a couple of times, asked a few questions, but yeah, you're exactly right. You can be playing with people close to your level four O's. If they're good at dinking, beat them at dinking. If they have good hands, challenge yeah. them more frequently. You can always get something yeah. out of the, uh, out of the practice and out of the game. And, you know, I'm, I was just, I was glad to drop a little knowledge for my little peasants down there who were uh, looking to come <laughs> up. And, and Hey, some of them came up, some of them didn't look at you, Rob. So, uh, Yep. Yeah. And I actually have been getting uh, some some uh, players contacting me, just asking me so, somewhat some structured coaching and some just kind of ask, like, how do I how do I break in? Uh, there's this yep. player, uh, Jonathan Medina Alvarez. He's had a couple uh, pretty solid results in singles. He has a good tennis background. He's about 40 years old. And he just contacted me about well, how do I break in? And just to talk about that briefly. A lot of players start off with those singles results and it kind of to get, even if you're a good player to wiggle your way into getting quality partners is very difficult. So especially if you have a life, this guy, he's got a young kid, he's got a job. Uh, So it is all about practicing with better players. I had the freedom to travel early to tournaments, go to places and practice, but that's the number one thing for me. I don't care where you live where you live, if you have to, you know, do two or three hours round trip to play with some guys worse than you in the morning uh, on a weekend, then you have to do it. You ha- it could be video games. It could be pickleball. It could be whatever it, the case may be, business. Talk to people. Play with people that are better than you. That's the only way. I would say, Rob, that I probably – all I wanted to do for the first year, 18 months, was just get touches. So basically get an arsenal of shots – know all the shots, have all the shots. And then I really took a big jump from probably about year and a half to, to two years, two and a half years of implementing those shots. So that was kind of the progression for me. Get the shots, get the touches, then start figuring out how to use them. And uh, that was the progression for me in the first two, two and a half years of my career. So, Absolutely correct. I couldn't, I could not agree with you more. Like that's what I always think about and talk about is like, if you want to, it doesn't matter what it is. If you want to accomplish something, and find success in something, seek out people that have already accomplished what you want to accomplish and surround yourself with them and add value to them in some way. Right. Like mm-hmm. a lot of these, like I, I, I literally left Austin because I had capped out, um, like, like my practice there, I was not going to get better staying there at that time. So you know, I was like, okay, well I have the flexibility to live anywhere. So I moved to, I moved to Florida, you know, Simone yeah. was there, Deca was there, Vivian was there. And I sought out that practice and I knew I was, uh, you know, I wasn't that good at the time, but I knew I was, I knew I had the potential and they knew um, that I would be a good fourth or I could fill in or whatever. And it, it, it made the difference. You have to just seek that out. And I a hundred percent agree The old, like you can drill all day long with your drilling partner. It's not going to matter. You have to play with better people because even the shots that you're hitting with your same level drilling partner aren't going to be good enough for, a higher to, to move up a level. You have to just play with people that are better than you period. End of story. That's it. Yep. Yeah. And I, I don't care how self-aware you are about your shot selection. When you're playing with four O's and then you're playing with pros, 
you are going to get bad habits no matter what, no matter how self-aware you are about the situation. So you have to play. Or discipline. Yeah. Yes. Be And just, just like you said, add some value to them. Maybe that's something off court. Maybe that's just being incredibly available when they need a fourth uh, to, to just be there, try your best. Um, at, at, when, when you're there, make sure you're making a lot of balls, giving them good practice. And then it's kind of an everybody win situation. So just wanted to touch on that. A lot of questions about aspiring pros, aspiring players to get to the top of their, you know, their area, the top, uh, a uh, couple couple courts in their area. So just just some things from a couple uh, pros that have been uh, along along the way and have some experience with it. I uh, just wanted to give a few tips there. So Rob, on a scale of one to ten, how happy are you that you have moved to the mainland from Hawaii? Would you say? Oh, I'm a ten. Like uh, Hawaii is fantastic to visit. I would say I I, I you just I like being in the mix. I like playing. I like practicing. I like playing high level pickleball. Um, I'm excited about everything I'm working on this year with the drive Dink and dine show with, uh, with this podcast. Um, yeah, I, I just missed all of it. You know, I'm not, I'm not, well, a couple things. One, I'm not really built to be a great employee where I have to be somewhere between nine and five every day. That's just not my jam. I, I, I really highly value freedom and flexibility as like one of my personal core values. So not being able to have that really puts me in a weird spot mentally. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked to be back. It's, um, it's pretty freeing. I don't have a lot of stuff. I feel really lean and I don't need a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm one of those people that not a big materials guy, possession guy. I like, I love moments, memories, experiences with people that I care about, friends, family, that kind of thing. Like those are my, those are kind of like my main values. That's what I like. And um, I feel like this year's shaping up to be to be a good one like that. So I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, you're in the mix, man. You, you don't have to necessarily, you, you don't have to do crazy planning just to get to where you need to get. You can, you can kind of fly more <laughs> yeah. by the seat of your pants uh, being on the mainland. So that's good. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And hey, I'm right there with you, Rob. All I really want to do is hang out with people I like. That's really my whole goal in life is to hang out with people I like. And sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, all, all good. Um, Rob, so we talked, we, we talked a little bit about this nomadic lifestyle that you've been living. Yeah. Here's a question for you. I'm in the complete opposite situation. I'm trying to create my compound. I'm very domesticated in a lot of ways. Whenever we are chatting about this domestication, do you ever have any inkling in your mind about possibly uh, getting to a domesticated point that I am, as we know, the grass is always greener. But tell me a little bit about that, Rob. Zero percent, little bit of percent. What do you think? No, so like I, 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 yeah, I think for me this year, this is like this is my thing. This is what I'm doing. But by no means do I think this is going to be how I live my life for the rest of my life. Um, I'm, I, I do like routine as well. I like routine. I like good, like building good, healthy habits, stuff like that, and that's. That's a little bit of a challenge on the road, right? Being in different places, being on airplanes a lot. It's hard to kind of stick to, you know, healthy eating, uh, good fitness routines, all, all that stuff, even if I'm playing pickleball a lot. Um, so there, you know, the, we always talk about it. the grass is always greener, right? So like, you know, you might, you might have some envy on, on like me being nomadic for a little bit. I might have some envy on like the stability you have and like the comforts you have at home, that kind of thing. The projects you're building, like having the compound and building the courts. Um, I think people always kind of have a craving for what, you know, what they don't have. Um, I, I, I can totally, yeah, I see myself, I'm, I will always kind of have like the wanderlust of, you know, wanting to travel and see new places and all that stuff. Uh, but I'm also keenly aware that I will also want a home base at some point and want to have, um, yeah, I, I, I want to have a family, want to, like, I, I want kids. Like I want, I want all of that. I probably won't have a super traditional life in the sense of like, you know, live in the suburbs, go to a nine to five job. It's going to, that's definitely going to be more non-traditional. Um, but yeah, I do. I, like I could see, I could be a house husband, Adam. I think, <laughs> you know, as Greg Dow, as Greg Dow said, Adam cracked the code. 
Adam I, Scott. I, I, it was so good just talking about our day, my daily routine, what she does, what I do, like who made the first move, all that stuff. Greg's just like, what do you mean? Like, oh, like that's what you do? Oh, it, completely different. So uh, you're exactly right. Uh, some people might say that I don't have the code cracked, but I kind of think that I do, Robert. So there you go. Adam, I, uh, what, what more do you want in your life, Adam? You have it. And you're still able uh, to like, you're not, you're not, you're not full nomad, but you're still, you know, you're still traveling. Like Corinne, Corinne loves like fun travel. You know, you're traveling now for like some work stuff, some pickleball commentary, right. stuff like that. But, right. um, you know, you know, Prof loves her adventure and you're right there for that. And I know yeah, uh, so, Prof likes her activities yeah. and yeah, so, kind of get wrangled so, into that one. But. So how about this? We talked about, we just want to hang yeah. out with people that we like. And yep. we have ran into this, especially in maybe two years ago and last year where Corinne, like you said, loves to travel for uh, pleasure and for fun. Have you found that some of the tournament grind and the traveling to pickleball tournaments has kind of taken away from your desire and your ability to travel personally? It's so, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting point because I, yeah, it's, I travel like I'm, I can't like the amount of travel I'm going to have this year is going to be a little ridiculous, especially doing the drive Deacon dine show and some of the others, you know, going to park city. I've got a thing, an engagement there early March. Like there's going to be a lot of stuff like that. That's work, quote unquote, work travel, pickleball related. Um, so the, I think more so for the weird thing for me is I'm not quite used to having my entire year planned out ahead of me. Of I'm going to be and what I'm going to be doing. That's right. super interesting and unique. Um, in the past, I used to, I used to be wildly spun. Like when I had my business, my advertising business pre pickleball, I was wildly spontaneous in terms of my travel, which I do miss that. And I feel like I'm a little more locked down in respect to needing to be certain places at certain dates, which is unusual for me. Uh, but for example, like I remember when I was living in San Diego, there was a, there was a marketing conference in Bangkok that was starting that day. And I had a, quite a few friends that were there. They're like, come on, come on. It's going to be so fun. You got to come. So I remember sitting at a coffee shop that morning and I was like, you know, and I had a lot of like airline miles through, um, through my business. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to get on a flight three hours from now and go to Bangkok. So <laughs> click, click, Boop, walked whoop. home, packed my bags straight to the airport. That evening I was in Bangkok, like stuff like that. Like I, like I don't, have the ability to really do that because I have so many places to be now and it's all scheduled yeah. out. So yeah, it, 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 uh, it changes things in that respect, but I still, I don't, yeah, the, the travel for pickleball doesn't take away my want and desire to travel for fun. Costa Rica gotcha. trip, it was a little pickleball. It was mostly for fun, right? Like I it still was. Was. crave stuff like, I still crave stuff like that. And you know what, Adam? I think uh, I think we should all do a trip sometime soon. A fun trip. I think it'd be good. No, I like that. I think that's a great idea to it. And I, I haven't done a lot of total spontaneous travel uh, here and there, but I remember the Costa Rica trip. You're like, hey, whatever, January 3rd, show up to Miami, pack light. That's all I'm telling you. And so I, I, I kept like... <laughs> I kept like mess. I kept like messaging you like throughout, and I was just like, "Well, like, what exactly do you mean, pack light?" You're like, yeah. "Don't worry about it," you know. And I'm like, "Well, like, exactly, <laughs> where are we going? Are we taking two planes? Do we have a straight shot? Are we on a boat? What are we doing?" Don't worry about it. Just pack light and be there. I was like, "All right, here we go." <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah so, and we uh, took. We, I forgot we took that small little plane and we landed yes. on a dirt runway when we got there, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, and it was. I was, I might've had a couple adult beverages the night before. So uh, that had something to do with it, but I was a little nauseous yeah. on that cloud hopper with the propellers. And then we got the, the helicopter on the way home. So it, it was quite an experience. Uh, we got COVID yeah. played a little pickleball, <laughs> drank, drank got beers together, the same beer together and rode on a helicopter. It's good times right there, Robert. Got, got, got spit on by Lucho. It's Lucho. I mean, he got spit on, man. I mean, you, I mean, you got to take it. What can you do? <laughs> Adam, with this is so this is a new year for you. You've got, I mean, you know, you're a high end content creator now. You've dialed back the pickle playing. Uh, you've got you've got a child on the way coming in May. I'm I'm just praying to God 
that your child has my birthday, which is May 14th. And I think Corinne's due on May 12th. It's, I mean, Correct. let's, let's get it done. Let's get it done. Do it for me. Hey, hey you don't, you don't have to, call, you don't have to call him. You don't have to call him Robert. You can, you can call him whatever you want, but just give it. Bless child. So yeah. So early May. So apparently if you do, uh, if you eat spicy food and do a lot of lovemaking, then that makes the baby come faster. So early May, we won't do any of that. Uh, and no, then we'll see if no. we can get it right there on May 14th just for you, Robert. I think that would be perfect. That would be perfect. Be oh, but to continue my little, uh, my thought and my question yeah. for you, Adam. Please, so you've please, got a please. lot of like, a lot of, a lot of life changes this year, professionally, mm -hmm. you know, personally. What are you most excited about just in 2023 as a whole? Uh, both personally and professionally. Yeah. Well, obviously the child is, uh, a big, big factor. Um, I have talked to many people about how I am a big fan of myself. I've just loved myself <laughs> aggr aggressively for 40 years, you know, and, uh, I, I am, and, and you know, uh, prof took a little piece of that pie and I was happy to give it to her, but I have a feeling that this child is going to take a much larger chunk of that pie from, uh, you know, me wanting to do what I doing what I want to do and things of that nature. Even though I know this is going to be a special experience, everyone has told me that it will be the biggest uh, change in my life ever. And I am, of course, have a little light anxiety and worry about it. But it's, uh, you know, everyone says it's a magical moment. And I have a lot more, you know, anticipation on the positive side than the negative. So uh, very, very excited for that. Uh, it's going to you know, the, the summer is going to be pretty locked down. Uh, we're going to have a couple weeks before the due date, a few weeks after the due date of, you know, just kind of hanging at the house and doing our thing. But uh, professionally, it's exciting too, Rob. Uh, I'm excited to be the voice of Major League Pickleball, uh, along with a few other colleagues all doing a great job. The first event was awesome. Um, I have uh, a couple events. I'm going to do some Beer City Open. I'm going to do some teaching with Simone throughout the year. Uh, gonna do some emceeing, uh, for a dink for pink down in Savannah, MC and commentary. So it, it, it's, it's very exciting on both ends and very different in a lot of ways. I, I don't really plan on playing any pickleball. Uh, and I'm very okay with that. I mean, we'll see at the end of the year, maybe I'm, I'm just jonesing to get back on the court, but I just don't think that's going to be the case, Rob, uh, very happy with what's going on. So, uh, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's an exciting time and I think I have, you know, my hand in enough jars to where I'm going to be able to kind of teach when I want to and here and there, as opposed to just having a, a totally stable structured clientele and where, where I'm home, uh, teaching 20, 30 hours of lessons a week. So, uh, I'm excited about it and, uh, I can't wait for, uh, the rest of the year. And you're going to be at a point soon where you don't have to leave your compound. Yeah, I know. That's, that's the goal. That's the goal. So, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I have like a little mile or two radius. I don't, I don't like to leave that bubble, Robert. I, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> I want to go you. places. I, 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 I travel, I travel for pickleball. I travel for pleasure. I can be social in those regards. I can do activities, one activity a day, Karen, not two. But when I'm home, I, I don't want to go outside of my bubble. I want to stay in my compound and hang out with family. And that's that's the friggin' plan, man. And you're trending in the right direction because all of this has come to fruition. Yeah, I know. I tell you what. I tell you what. So, uh, okay, let's see here. Okay, how about this? So what would you yeah. say that your optimal distribution of, we'll say, play content creation and uh, practice slash teaching. What, what, what would be your optimal distribution? I would guess teaching would be 0% if you had to choose, but you just tell me, Robert, what do yep. you think? No, yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean, te te teaching's at zero. Um, unless, Adam, like there's a few exceptions. Like I would not mind teaching with you. Like teaching with you would be super fun. Um, like if I'm with good people that I like teaching, it's great. I'm into that. Uh, but teaching by myself, a group of three O's, not super fun for me. Right. Here. Like you guys, none of you have talent. You, none of you guys, like I, I'm, I'm happy that you guys are having fun, but 
you're not listening to what I'm telling you, nor do you have the <laughs> capability of actually getting better. So like that, that's just stuff running through my head when I teach. Not always. Some of you have talent. Some of you are able to get better, but a lot of times um, I just, it, it's fun seeing people have fun. So, but frustrating when they can't make changes regardless. Uh, teaching, I would say 1% because there are moments where I'm like, okay, that would be fun. Um, would like and enjoy and believe it or not, there's a um, business that I'm involved with called uh, Three Two One Pickleball, which is actually working on doing doing corporate events. So mm, yeah, you know, right. hosting ho- hosting host like sponsoring networking events for different companies, doing some team building stuff, um, and that will require some some instruction, more of like intro lesson, and then kind of hooking up a round robin and social happy hour type stuff. So less, less like clinic camp teaching and more of just Mm -hmm. like bringing new people into the sport, which I actually do find some uh, fulfillment out of introducing people to pickleball, because as you know, Adam, people get hooked to pickleball really quickly. And, and in most cases, it's a pretty, it's a pretty positive outcome for their life because, you know, it's super social. It keeps you healthy, keeps you moving. So all that stuff. So there's, there's some fulfillment there. Uh, but in terms of content creation, dude, I love it. Like, you know, I, I don't know if I've talked much about this, but I'm writing a daily newsletter this year. Uh, if you want to subscribe, you can go to robnunnery.com. Shameless plug. But uh, it's basically Rob just documenting Nunnery. my... <laughs> robnunnery.com, ladies and gentlemen. Can't, can't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I just documenting my year there. Basically day-to-day ups and downs, struggles, hardships, joy what I'm having fun with all the just all the stuff that's going on in my life so I've uh, been positive feedback around that um, and every time I do a podcast with you every time I write a newsletter um, dude there's to me there's like this is how that's how I know like what I'm doing is what I should be doing is I love after doing one of these or writing a newsletter the act of creating something that didn't exist before and putting something out into the world. So the act of creation and content creation for me, I love it. It's super fulfilling. Um, and I've done a lot of work in my life that hasn't been. So the fact that I'm able to do work that I like and feel that adds value to other people. Yeah. Love it. So content creation is really up there for me. Um, the pickleball playing scene, tournament scene, I love competing and I love like the grind of fighting and being on court and all that. Um, the, 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 the people and the external stuff around the pickleball tournament world and all of kind of the, the gossip and the talking and all of that stuff, that kind of, um, that kind of sours it a little bit for me, but, um, actual playing and competing. I love it. Like right up there to me with content creation and, and the joy I get from that. So, um, yeah, that's kind of the breakdown, but, uh, yeah, teaching's pretty low. Well, there you go. That was a fantastic answer. Exactly what I was looking for with that question, Robert. And to piggyback (laughs) off a a deep, wonderful answer like that, my most important question is we're creeping up on an hour and 15 minutes with the red button on, which is, you know, kind of getting to my threshold of, uh, uh, yes, correct. So do you prefer chocolate or fruity candy when you go to the gas station, Robert? You tell me. You tell me. What do you think? I prefer, I, think? Fr- I, I, I prefer fruity candy, Skittles, uh, Harry Bow Sours. Ooh, gummy bears, fantastic. Maybe a little Sour Patch Kids. I think that you are a maybe a chocolate and a nut kind of guy. Wait, is that is that right, Rob? It's not, Adam. What is I, it? Tell this me. is a perfect example. You're right. You're like this is. This couldn't be more ideal. I love that you asked this question. Okay, let's. Oh, the fr- you're a fruity guy. How did I not know this? We've stayed together before. I thought you were like a Snickers. Oh, you got du- you doubled up. Do-, do you like the watermelons too? The Sour Patch watermelons? I like those. Pretty- it's actually my first time having them, but I'm a, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. Mm-hmm. You know why? Excellent. It's because it's sour and sweet. I thought you were just setting it up perfectly for it. It feels right. But you know, <laughs> it's all good. It's, it, no, it's no, all no, good. No, no. Uh, okay, we can't well, overdo Robert. that. Uh, yeah. I was just going to say this was a this was a lovely uh, episode. We talked a little bit about pickleball, a little bit not about pickleball, which I think is a nice mix. Uh, I think mm-hmm. next week we might uh, get back into the swing of things with a possible guest for next week. Yes. Uh, we have uh, we have Daytona 
this weekend. We have a PPA the following weekend. So we got plenty of pickleball that we're going to be talking about as well. But I like these ones where it's a little balance of both off court, on court. Um, so uh, this was uh, a lovely uh, Tuesday afternoon. And thank you so much, co-host. And I think it's time to us uh, uh, bid farewell to our guests. Farewell. Farewell. Because you know why? Why? Because it feels right. It feels right. Legendary. Yeah.